Thank you. Thank you, General. I just have um, a question on the, on the major questions doctrine, and I wanted just a little bit background for why I want to get your views on how it applies. You're, you're arguing here that um, no notice and comment proceeding was required before the action taken on the half trillion dollars of loans, uh, and that because of your view that the President can act unilaterally, that there was no role for Congress to play in this either. And at least in this case, given your view of standing, there's no role for us to play in this, in this either. Now, we take very seriously the idea of uh, separation of powers and that power should be divided uh, to prevent its uh, uh, abuse. And there are many procedural niceties uh, that have to be followed for the same purpose. Um, the case reminds me of the one we had a few years ago under a different administration where the administration tried acting on its own to cancel the DREAMers program. Uh, and we blocked that effort. And I just wonder, given the posture of the case and given our historic concern about uh, separation of powers, you would recognize at least that this is a case that presents extraordinarily serious, important issues about the role of Congress and about the role that we should exercise in scrutinizing that? S significant enough that the major questions doctrine ought to be considered implicated? Well, Mr. Chief Justice, let me try to respond to the concerns about both the role for the judiciary and the role for Congress here. Um, we are not suggesting that there's no role for the judiciary to play. It's that these plaintiffs are not proper plaintiffs in this case. Of course, the court is bound by Article 3, and as I acknowledge to Justice Alito, we think that loan servicers, for example, would have standing to challenge this plan. But the fact that the, the loan servicers haven't yet challenged to date doesn't provide a basis to overlook those fundamental Article 3 requirements and distort the meaning of how this court has previously articulated standing principles uh, in a circumstance where the states can't otherwise demonstrate their standing to sue. With respect to the role for Congress, I think what's clear is, of course, we're recognizing that Congress could take additional action if it disapproves this plan. In fact, there were bills introduced to alter the text of the HEROES Act to specifically provide that the Secretary can't authorize loan discharge. Those bills didn't pass, but that's one role Congress can play. I think, though, that if the court is focused on trying to ensure that Congress's role in this process is respected, that just argues in favor of reading this text in line with what the plain language suggests. You know, these are not words of limitation in the actual assertion of authority here, waive or modify any Title IV provision. The states want this court to say Congress really only meant waive or modify some of the provisions, not all of them, not the central provisions that govern repayment and cancellation, when those would have been obvious candidates for waiver or modification in a loan discharge program. And if the court overrides that clear HEROES Act language here, I think that it could only thwart Congress's intent in this particular posture of ensuring that you have the tools, the Secretary has the tools he needs to take care of Americans in a, a national emergency situation. Well, whether Congress uh, acted or not was a factor that we considered in the major questions doctrine. And uh, the way we considered it uh, is whether or not the issue uh, that was before the court is something that had been seriously considered and debated and was a matter of political controversy before Congress. Um, that certainly is the case here, right? That's right. We're not disputing that this is a politically significant action. But if you're well, focused— Well, not just a politically significant action, but one that has the attention of Congress. The fact that it hasn't acted under the major questions doctrine but has considered the matter, uh, we cited as support for the notion that maybe it should be one for Congress. If you're talking about this in the abstract, I think most casual observers would say if you're going to give up that much amount of money, if you're going to affect— the obligations of that many Americans on a subject that's of great controversy, they would think that's something for Congress to act on. And if they haven't acted on it, then maybe that's a good lesson to say for the uh, p uh, president or, or the um, uh, administrative bureaucracy that maybe that's not something they should undertake on their own. Well, let me react to that in a couple of different ways, Mr. Chief Justice. First is to emphasize that the unenacted legislation that the states are pointing to here um, did not mirror the particulars of this plan. So I don't think it would be right to say that Congress has specifically focused on this plan and disapproved it. And if the court were to go down that road, I'd point again to the fact that there's, there's legislative inaction on the other side of not amending the HEROES Act. But I would think that the court, as it usually does, would place more focus on enacted legislation. And here, 
during the pandemic, Congress enacted a provision of the American Rescue Plan that specifically anticipated and sought to facilitate a program of loan discharge by providing that it wouldn't be subject to federal taxation from 2021 to 2025. So I think that that congressional action actually carries more weight in the analysis. And a few years ago, uh, by Justice Scalia, he talked about what, what the word modify means. And uh, it's, he said modified, in our view, connotes moderate change. He said it might be good English to say that the French Revolution modified the status of the French nobility, but only because there's a figure of speech called understatement and a literary device known as sarcasm. We're talking about half a trillion dollars uh, and 43 million Americans. How does that fit under the normal understanding of modifying? So, of course, I recognize that in MCI, Justice Scalia's opinion adopted a narrower understanding of that term, but I don't read that opinion to set forth a universal meaning of modify, no matter the statutory context. And here, of course, we have a broader phrase, waive or modify. It's undisputed, and the states aren't contesting, that the ordinary meaning of waive means to eliminate an obligation in its entirety. And I think if you look at that phrase in the context of the statute, that means that modify has to mean making a change up to the point of wholesale elimination. It would be really strange for Congress to say you can eliminate obligations altogether or tweak them just the littlest bit, but you can't do anything in between. Well, but it's waive particular reg regulatory or statutory provisions. That's that, right. That to me suggests a much more focused use of the word. Well, it's waive or modify paired with the authority to do that with respect to any Title IV provision. So I think that that, that is the... It doesn't say waive, modify or waive loan balances. That's true, but it's very clear that under the Title IV provisions that are expressly referenced in the statute, things like repayment obligations, cancellation, discharge are core features of the program and obvious candidates for waiver in a statute, the central purpose of which is to provide debt relief to borrowers. You know, Congress itself has provided for loan discharge and other circumstances in response to borrower hardship. It's included provisions in the Higher Education Act for bankruptcy, for example, or for total disability um, or school closure, other kinds of hardships. And so it couldn't have surprised Congress one bit that in response to hardship posed by a national emergency, the secretary might consider similarly providing discharge if that's what it takes to make sure borrowers don't default. You think because there's a provision to allow a waiver when your school closes, that because of that Congress shouldn't have been surprised when half a trillion dollars is wiped off the books? Well, I think it demonstrates that in a statute that's centrally focused on providing financial relief, that that terminology should be given its plain meaning, and Congress could have anticipated that in a particular situation, you might expect that the way that you need to ameliorate the borrower harm is through loan forgiveness. And Mr. Chief Justice, maybe I can just use an example drawn from the initial context of promulgation of this statutory relief. It was initially a bill that was limited just to helping service members who were fighting in wars. And think about an example of a service member who goes off to war, and you can provide HEROES Act relief to ensure that the service member doesn't have to pay down the loan while the term of service, but if something were to happen that left that service member worse off because of his service, say a, a disability that doesn't qualify for total discharge, it makes perfect sense to think that Congress would have expected that the secretary would have authority under this act to make the service member whole and to ensure, just as the plain language suggests, that that service member isn't going to be left worse off because of the circumstance that prompted his service in the first place. And so there's that first order question of whether you can ever do any debt discharge. And I think in that context, it's perfectly sensible to read this language to authorize that. I understand your um, argument on standing, and I, I know this isn't directly on point, but when I saw it, it's sort of like the uh, equal protection cases, you know, where discrimination between men and women on the, the level of pensions and uh, the, the, the women, uh, the widows get more and the widowers get less and uh, the, the challenge is brought. And the argument was, well, if you win, we're going to take the excess away from the, the widows. So you're not going to get anything. So you don't have standing. Um, why is that case? I, I appreciate the way in which it's different, but why isn't that at least some authority on which they can rely? 
I, I think that the equal protection cases are fundamentally different because there, your injury is your complaint of unequal treatment. And so whether you level up or level down, your injury is being redressed. You're no longer being subject to unequal treatment and instead everyone is being subject to the same treatment. But this case stands in a very different posture because here their argument is our injury is we're not getting loan forgiveness. And the, the relief they're seeking, which is a declaration that the HEROES Act doesn't authorize loan forgiveness in the first place, doesn't redress that injury one bit. It right, just carves it's, it's, it into stone. Right, but I mean, it, without looking after the case, yes, you could lower it or, or raise it, but that's an uncertainty that had, did, we, did not, we decided that that did not affect their right to bring the action because it may be changed in a particular way. And I suppose their argument would be that, you know, they are injured by not being uh, participating uh, in the program. And if the program is struck down in its current form, it may be changed in a particular way that would help them. So I think that there is, though, a, a complete disconnect between the claim of injury. And it's true that in the equal protection context, you don't know ex ante what the remedy is going to be. But the court has determined that doesn't affect standing because either way, no matter what remedy occurs based on the equal protection injury, it's going to fix the nature of the harm of providing unequal treatment. And here, the, the only certainty is that if they prevail on their claims, it's going to make it harder to provide them or anyone else with debt relief. Their suggestion here that the secretary wholly lacks this authority under the Heroes Act and their assertion of arguments to support that claim that broadly attack this whole concept of loan forgiveness, I think demonstrate that we're far afield from the equal protection case law. Can I Counsel, I'm, I'm sure I'm re misreading the graphs uh, on, I'm looking at 247, 248. Didn't half the borrowers say they would not have any trouble paying their loans without regard to the forgiveness program? So it varies based on income bracket. And yes, it's true that, that in certain income brackets, the data I think reflected that, you know, 51% of borrowers expected that they would be unable to pay their student loans. That wasn't the only, sec the only data the secretary consulted, though. In those same studies that he referenced, there was uh, general data about levels of financial insecurity. And overwhelming majorities of borrowers expressed huge financial insecurity concerns about their ability to make ends meet going to 10 years into the future. Now, I think one of the important things to recognize, again, as I had mentioned in the last argument, is that it's not necessary for the secretary to make a finding that each and every borrower who really receives relief under this plan would have necessarily gone into default or delinquency without it. No, of course not. But I mean, it does kind of uh, factor into the consideration, particularly in a situation where you don't have notice and comment uh, proceedings. Uh, that maybe, uh, th again, that's something that a broader um, uh, representation of national interests in Congress would take into account rather than what the, uh, uh, the secretary in a particular case, who's weighing a lot of options and considerations as well, would take into account. I mean, if more than half the people say they don't need this relief, extending relief to that breadth uh, certainly raises questions. So let me be clear that I think there is an avenue to address those kinds of questions with overbreath. I, I don't think that it's a function of statutory interpretation, though. That would be applications of the statute to particular fact patterns and whether the secretary could justify the lines he drew and the level of relief he decided was necessary. And here, Secre Car Secretary Cardona explained that huge numbers of borrowers were going to go into default and delinquency, and it's not as though he could easily segregate and say, here are the 50 percent where I know for sure it will happen, and here are the 50 percent where it won't, if, if he could make that kind of determination, it might provide a basis to determine that he should have drawn different lines. But we don't have anything like that here. And I would just point again to the forbearance policy. You know, that has applied across the board to every single student loan borrower with a federally held loan for the past three years. Um, but I think that both secretaries acted entirely within the domain of the HEROES Act and recognizing that that kind of broad class-wide relief was necessary due to the particular exigencies of this emergency. Thank you. Um, since we're dealing uh, in, a, in a case with individual borrowers or would-be borrowers, I, I think it uh, appropriate to consider um, some of the fairness arguments. Uh, you know, you have a, two situations, both two kids come out of high school, they can't afford college, one takes a loan, uh, and the other says, well, I'm going to, you know, try my hand at setting up a lawn care service, um, uh, and he takes out a bank loan uh, for that. 
Uh, at the end of four years, we know statistically that the uh, person with the college degree is going to do significantly financially better over the course of uh, life than the person without. Um, and then along comes the government and tells that person, uh, you don't have to pay your loan. Uh, nobody's telling the uh, person who is trying to set up the lawn service business that he doesn't have to pay his loan. He still does, uh, even though uh, his tax dollars are going to support the forgiveness of the loan. Uh, for the, uh, the college graduate who's now going to make a lot more than him uh, over the course of his lifetime. Now, it seems to me you may have views on fairness of that and they don't count. I may have views on the fairness of that and mine don't count. We'd like to usually leave situations of that sort when you're talking about spending the government's money, which is the taxpayer's money, to uh, the people in charge of the money, which is Congress. Now, why isn't that a factor that should enter into our consideration under the major questions doctrine again, where we look at things a little more strictly than we might otherwise when we're talking about statutory grants of authority to make sure that this is something that Congress would have contemplated? So my reaction to that, Mr. Chief Justice, is that Congress did take those kinds of considerations into account in specifically providing this authority to the secretary. I think that the same kinds of arguments well, about Well, it's just fairness, circular. You're, 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 it sort of you know, begs the question to say that, for, uh, first, I don't see any evidence that they took the, the, the person who's trying to start the lawn service because he can't afford college. I don't see any evidence that they took him into account. Um, but if that's what Congress would need to take into account and show, then it can't legislate. It can't provide the executive with pre-authorization to take action into an emergency. Congress can't look ahead to the future and say, okay, in the year 2020, when an unprecedented global pandemic hits, we've decided that the lawn care professional should you know not benefit from this program, but the student. So and yet you're relying should. on the on, you're relying on an interpretation of the statutory authority uh, to say that that's implementing Congress's intent to do that in a pandemic that they couldn't have foreseen. We do think no, they would have foreseen the idea when they said uh, uh, modify or waive that that would mean waiving the whole liability for 40 million Americans at a cost of half a trillion dollars, that they, foreseen, they foresaw that enough to allow the secretary to act without any express congressional authority any more express congressional authority than the authority you rely on? Well, let me break it apart into two different components, because I think there's a first order question of whether Congress could have foreseen the possibility of debt discharge at all. And I think the answer to that has to be yes. That was a well-established form of relief that you can provide to borrowers in, in hardship situations. As I previously mentioned, it's one of the core provisions in the Title IV. Uh, and Congress, in specifically enacting a statute that's aimed at this problem of not leaving borrowers worse off in reaction to a national emergency clearly understood that using this so we're just broad going language. That, uh, well, so that's I'm the not, first not, question. I recognize. I'm not, I'm not faulting no. you for repeating your answer since I think I probably repeated <laughs> my question. But you're just saying you know, it's the same argument about what modify and waive means. It is as a statutory matter on the categorical argument about debt discharge. Now, you have asked me several questions about the scope of this program, and, and let me try to be responsive to that. I recognize that this is a big program, but that's in direct reaction to the COVID-19 pandemic, which itself was a really big problem. There hasn't been a national emergency like this in the time that the HEROES Act has been on the books that's affected this many borrowers. And so I think it's not surprising to see in response to this once in a century pandemic, the kind of relief that the secretaries have offered here, the forbearance policy that has itself cost $150 billion and now this loan forgiveness program. To the extent that you have concerns about the scope and size of the program though, I would say that if I can get you to agree with me, and maybe I can't, on this point that the categorical debt discharge argument doesn't work as a statutory matter, then I think the right place to look to house those concerns is an arbitrary and capricious review. We think here that the secretary drew reasonable lines in crafting the scope of relief, but if you disagree or if you think he should have taken different interests into account, that would be a basis to reverse him on arbitrary and capricious grounds, not to distort the plain meaning of the HEROES Act. Thank you.